Honourable members, I call on the Honourable Morris Williamson to make his valedictory statement. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker it's uh, the hardest speech that I'm ever going to make in this place because I've been given a very stern warning from Foreign Affairs <laughs> that I am now a diplomat and that I have got to not do any of the things that can cause trouble. And when I told that to Sir John Key a few hours ago, he says, well, given you never listened to my advice like that for 10 years, why the bloody hell would you listen to them? <laughs> but I am going to try and be diplomatic. I'm going to try and make sure that instead of calling somebody a wanker, I'll call them an owner-operator, <laughs> because that's the diplomatic way to go these days. And I do know that what I'm about to say is irrelevant to most of you, because I was taught by my dad once, no matter how great your greatest high, or how deep your deepest low, there's over 1.6 billion Chinese who couldn't give a toss. <laughs> and I think that uh, puts everything into a true perspective. So, Mr Speaker, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to wax lyrical about my 30 years in this place and how things have changed so dramatically, uh, cover a few achievements but not too many to bore you, canvas a couple of the highs and sort of steer clear of a couple of the really deep lows that got really quite bad and make an apology or two and finally pose that real question I think we should all pose, did I make a difference? So first of all a few tributes and these are really important. I want to pay a tribute to my mum Noreen who is uh, 95 years old, lives in her own house in Matamata and will be watching this and for a lady who just goes about her daily life, won't go into an institution, sharp as a brain, calls me up and tells me that I'm a completely useless sod when I don't agree with things she said. Mum, you've been amazing. I'll be very careful not to use something that my, uh, my nephew used at his mother's funeral, at my sister's funeral. He said, Mum, you're the greatest mum I've ever had. And I think I've got to be very, very careful not to fall into that trap. And my late father, Rex, served, on the battle, uh, served on, in the Battle of uh, River Plate, which is mentioned up on the wall over there, uh, on the Achilles along with his brother. And we grew up in Matamata on a farm, and they were great parents and still what I think are completely really top-notch values, and that's all you can expect as to where you go from there. Uh, to my wife, Raywin, now you were sitting, oh, Raywin up there, Raywin at the back there. My wife, Raywin, of 41 long suffering years. Um, I think the reason we've lasted 41 years is that I leave for Wellington every Tuesday and come back every Friday. She's really pleased to see me when I come home on Friday, and she's even more pleased to see me leaving on the Tuesday. <laughs> so I think that's what's worked. Uh, my son, Simon, I've got three kids. Uh, they're all adopted, so they're lucky not to get the genes. So they really are going to have a chance in life of being somebody. <laughs> my, my son, Simon, right up there at the, back, uh, at the front there, is an amazing guy. His, he's a wordsmith. I think he came second in the world in uh, Cambridge English exams, uh, and he is actually worthwhile employing if you're looking for someone to be a wordsmith or a... <laughs> he actually knows where a few dead bodies are buried as well. Now, there's a couple of the family members that aren't here, so I'm going to try and do something. You'll, you'll know that I've always been uh, famous for doing PowerPoints. So they tell me that the parliamentary cameras can do this. Uh, the twins. I have twin son, uh, twins, uh, a boy and a girl. This is Connor, my twin son. He is uh, currently on a scholarship to South Carolina University on a tennis scholarship. He is simply, as you will hopefully see by this one, if we can flick it in, an amazing, just an amazing tennis player. So Connor, uh, I'm really proud of you as well. And my daughter, Brittany, um, who is a makeup artist and uh, thinks she's pretty cool, uh, and she is, um, just amazing. A couple more. One more, one more photo clip in, and then I'll do my dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and, if I, and if I thought my kids were fantastic, have a look at these two. <laughs> That's waffles and pebbles. <laughs> and if I'm ever grumpy or hungover in the morning when I wake up, that's what I wake up to look at. OK, a couple of secretaries. Now, I, I've been here 30 years. And I think, I think I've got a record for this. The same electorate secretary for the entire 30 years, Carla. <laughs> Carla's up the back. <laughs> Carla Mickelson, just amazing. And I tell you what, 30 years. I mean, you get less for murder, Carla. <laughs> uh, and um, it's been a, a, 
And there's been times when I've arrived at the office and she's just stared at me and go, oh my God, what have you done now? <laughs> and another amazing uh, secretary here in parliament, Bridie Cooper up there, but was Bridie Wilkinson for the most of her life and got married a couple of years ago. Bridie has just been amazing. I worked for her for 30 years. <laughs> And to have one in Wellington and one in Auckland for 30 years means I can't be as big a bastard as I've been accused in the media from time to time. Uh, a couple of friends just here that I want to pay tribute to. John Slater. Where are you hiding? I, I saw you over there. No, John Slater's up here. John Slater, past president of the National Party. We used to go out canvassing together uh, many, many years ago. And one day we decided, let's have a crack at taking over this party. He got to be uh, the president of the party and I got to be a front bench minister. So that wasn't too bad. Peter Martin, uh, just up there behind the pole, is the electorate chairman in Pakaranga, and what an absolute stalwart he has been in the electorate for very many, many years. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm reminded in the electorate of how important it is to get name recognition. And before I got elected the first time, I was working hard because Labor were hellishly popular in 1987, and I wasn't sure I could win the seat. So I did everything I could, and a guy came to see me and said, I need your help. And I put hours and hours of work into it. And I thought, I've got him. He's going to be a voter for me. And then he dropped a big envelope round at my house that night. And it was addressed to Mr William Morrison. And, <laughs> and if you know, Morrison was the actual member of parliament at the time. And William Morrison wasn't going to cut it when he went to vote. Uh, a couple of other close friends from Air New Zealand days, Ian Hambly, Alan Gaskin. You guys, we've had an amazing uh, ride through life. And it's been fun. Now, there's a couple up here I want to point out to the, Ron and Jane Woodrow. These people are Wellingtonians who have provided a refuge that I could run to and hide when anything went wrong. And I think that's just about every week at one point. Uh, Jane would always cook the most amazing meals and Ron would always have the ideas about how to solve the world. And Ron shares with me this amazing love of technology. And so when I used to come back from the States and tell Bill Birch about Bluetooth and Java and, and so on, I, I could just see it in his face like, I haven't got a bloody clue what you're talking about and so what. And I was an advocate of the internet long before it even came here. I argued about it, it would change our lives, we would live on it, we would shop on it, uh, we would transact, and I'm quite pleased about it. So the point that when we had Bill Gates out here and I did a few presentations while he was here, he was good enough to give me a copy of his book at the end and written in the front of it, he's got, to Morris, you are my favourite power user I, help, I hope the whole world learns from what you have done in New Zealand, signed Bill. So that's not too bad to have Bill Gates' signature on a book. <laughs> OK. Uh, I had the first iPhone ever in New Zealand, and I had the first iPad. And I remember bringing it into the house one day, and I think Tariana Turia was more excited about it than anybody else. And others just dismissed it as oh, another one of Williamson's little fads. Well, you're all going to live on them now. And I tell you what, with 3D printing and driverless cars and so on, you have no idea how your world's going to change. And what a difference that was to when we came. There was no internet. There was no computers. I went to Hong Kong and bought myself a PC. And I bought it down, set it up in my office up on the third floor. And Sir Robert Muldoon walked past my office, stopped back, back, looked in at me working. And all I was doing was doing a word processing, writing a letter. And he goes, ah, how's the mad scientist tonight then, eh? Ah. <laughs> So, a few things about achievements, because I think you should say them. I mean, I've gone too much because you go, know, this is boring, who cares? But um, as long as serving minister for a whole range of portfolios, I think 15 years for the statistics portfolio, but for a number of others, longest serving communications minister, certainly longest serving building and construction minister, and a number of others. But that really doesn't matter if you didn't do anything. Well, right from the moment I got here, I put a private member's bill in and drove it hard about increasing the penalties for cruelty to animals. And I've always believed in what Mahatma Gandhi said, that the, the, the degree to which a nation can be judged as having developed is the way they treat their animals. And I think anybody, anyone who can be cruel to animals, really has something seriously, seriously wrong with them. So after that, I did a few things, became a minister, and I've got some things that I'm pretty proud of. Set up Pharmac in 1993, trying to implement a, a really good way of buying drugs without the drug companies being able to game us. And I think Pharmac's one of our greatest inventions, and I hope it never, ever gets taken away. But I had a couple of failures along the way. We tried. Uh, really, I'm going to make sure. Simon Upton's view was, and I went with it, uh, we could charge people for the hotel part of their hospital stay. Because 
when they go to hospital, they don't, they're not at home, so they're not eating meals and they're not in their bed and using electricity. So we could at least just bill them for that bit of it. And I tell you, Mr Speaker, that was about as successful as Lord Mountbatten's Irish holiday. Um, <laughs> oh. Okay, moving right along. Um, one, of, one of the things I'm really proud of was I set up uh, the Maori Broadcasting Funding Agency. You'll know it as Te Mangapahu, but I called it Te Reo Irangi Whakapuaki, right? Okay, cool. And we set up 23 Maori radio stations. And this is something no one knows, and my colleagues are going to hate me when I tell you this. I actually put on the board of that two people, I'm going to tell you, one was Honi Harawera, because at that time he was a radio broadcaster and I thought he brought some value to it, and the other was somebody who you will not forgive me for, was Annette Sykes. <laughs> I had to take her off the board only a couple of years later when she advocated blowing up dams and burning down forests, but that's just a little bit along the way. So I did things like deregulated the postal service and stopped New Zealand Post having a monopoly on carrying bloody letters, how stupid was that? But there's a few things I'm really proud of. Mr Speaker, in this House, in 1999, I got up and I actually tabled the Mann report about the Erebus crash. Now, I was at Air New Zealand, I was deeply involved in what went on, and Justice Mann got it right. It is so wrong to blame just the pilot when all of the systemics <laughs> failure. All of the systems failed that pilot and to blame him alone was wrong, and I was so proud to table that because it had never been tabled, so Robert had refused to have it tabled. It was tabled in this House, and it is a formal view of what happened at Erebus. It was a systemic failure, not one error. And to go to lunch with Marguerite Mann, the wife of Justice Mann, and with Maria Collins, and to get photos out the front, it's just the most moving, stunning time of my life, and I'll never forget it. Um, I've had to make some pretty tough decisions. You know, I got to tack for the Crafer Farm sale to Peng, uh, Shanghai Peng Shin, but sir, the law was quite clear that if they met the criteria, they met the criteria. Uh, Prime Minister John Key came to me one day and says, we've got to do something about fixing the weather tide homes, and I said, well, it's none of our problem, and he said, I know, and I said, if I go and see Bill English, he'll say, no money, and he said, I know, uh, but he said, we've got to do it, and we did, and we put a package together, and thousands of people have been able to get their house fixed from that package. Smartgate, customs, I know there's some customs, uh, previous controller, current controller and others in the, in the audience today. Martin Dunn was a stunning controller of, of, of customs and Carolyn Tremaine is, is his replacement is also. <laughs> so uh, you're not allowed to have favourites but customs was by far my favourite. And to have implemented technology which means we process people in about 18 seconds flat through the border uh, was what I think really worthwhile. And the Maritime Transport Bill, Trevor, Trevor Mallard would probably be one of the few, oh no, no, sorry, Ruth will remember it, where we went night after night for week after week under urgency till three in the morning voting on plimsoll lines, on toy ships and so on. But it was such a touchstone bill. Helen Clark said it was the most pernicious, evil, disgraceful legislation this House had ever seen, and if Labor ever got elected it would be the first thing to go. And I'm proud to say that after nine years, not one clause of that bill got changed. <laughs> not one clause of it allowed our ships to, tr to ply the coast and do well. And bringing things like uh, geospatial uh, into, the, uh, into the whole public service, to make sure the public service didn't think that data should be just tabular formed anymore, but actually having maps of where this occurred and how it occurred were better. Probably my greatest, uh, what I think, greatest success in getting something done but was hated beyond your wildest belief was bringing in the photo driver's licence. And I thank very much Harry Dinehoven, I think was here really, he might have gone off the drinks now, but he and about eight other Labor members crossed the floor to give me the numbers on it because we had some of ours who weren't prepared to vote. Now I tell you, Leighton Smith waged war against me, daily. This was evil, this was big brother, this was the identity card start of it and you'd never, and uh, my wife Raywin used to say to me, why don't you just give it up, I can't get in the car without hearing them tearing you to shreds. Well we did it. It had the biggest drop in our road toll ever and I've never heard it raised again. And that's what you have to do around this place, if it's right you do it, you stand your ground and at the end of it if it was right it will be proved to be right and I'm really pleased. And finally, just quickly, uh, one that I didn't expect for it to be of any great moment was the gay marriage speech. Uh, went to 59 countries, uh, was translated into 19 languages. Uh, and a quick update, just in case I got the Parliamentary Library to tell me that since it was passed, 
We've had 1,500 Kiwis uh, uh, in a gay marriage, or 1,500 same-sex couple marriage, out of 100,000 marriages during that time. So about 1.5%. So the world hasn't come to an end. We haven't had the gay onslaught wipe the rest of us heterosexuals out, as was claimed. And to those people who sent me some of the nasty, uh, some, of the, some of the emails were great. I hope you die of age, you bastard. <laughs> and that was one of the nicer ones I can't use. <laughs> I can't. Well, I've had a checkup before I head to the States, and there's still no sign of HIV AIDS at this point, so I'm all right. And I also checked um, the birth certificate, and my parents were actually married uh, on the day I was born. So, so, not so much of a bastard. Right, OK, a few regrets. Yeah, there's a few regrets, and I'm, I'm only going to do one, or two, or five, or whatever. Um, the one I think is the biggest regret ever is I never, ever was able to persuade my ministerial colleagues that we really should get rid of commercial television. I seriously, seriously don't know why the government owns a commercial television station. Oh, I know. It's so it can promote New Zealand culture and identity. So I had a look at the programme schedule. MasterChef Australia, followed by Mrs Brown's Boys, Emmerdale Farm this afternoon, Coronation Street tonight, Instant Gardener, which I don't know, but it is a British programme of some sort, followed by Four in the Bed. You'll be able to tell me more about that, Murray. And, and... You can tell me about it later. And The Chase and The Tipping Point, both British. How the hell is that promoting New Zealand culture? For goodness sake. And its value, when I tried, I pleaded with Jim Bolger about it, its value back then was about four times what it is now, and it's now four times what it will be, because nobody, nobody is going to watch free-to-air, ordinary TV in the future. They're going, to, um, they're going to watch it via what I think is my greatest little backroom success, and I'm pleased that Sir John Key's here. Because I went to John Key in 2006 after having worked very, very closely with Ron Woodrow. Now, I mentioned Ron before, where he was a bastion, I go and hide it, but the guy was so forward-thinking in technology, he rolled out CityLink which was the big fibre optic loop CBD here in Wellington. Long, but he did it himself with his own money and then sold it. So he was always on about how fibre was the future. And I remember talking to John and, uh, and he said, ah, oh, you know, the, the budgets are tied and I don't think you'll get it through. So I went to some of the policy meetings and I don't think Bill was pretty keen on it either. And every time I went, it was just struggle, struggle, trying to say fibre to the premises. It was unheard of. Even the Australians were only going to get fibre to the cabinet. And it was just a... It was just a the old Russian water drip Chinese torture, and I tried to get some people from the private sector involved. One who I thought would be involved just said it was a nonsense, it wouldn't happen, and you're dreaming. And now he actually is a board member of Crown Fibre Holding, so that's quite interesting. <laughs> but in the end, I think John uh, Key, and I think he might admit it, and, and uh, Bill English finally just gave in to get me to shut up. And we finally put together the ultra-fast board brand package and to roll out fibre, and I think it's the greatest enabler the greatest economic enabler that this country will have. So, elements of pride. Oh, there's one thing I was really proud of. I thought this was amazing. When Helen Clark was inducted into the Order of New Zealand, I was the minister she requested attended in Auckland, and I did at Government House, and I was really proud to be there. But I had to sort of offer up an apology at the time, and I'll make sure I get it on the record now, because we had sparred a lot before. And once in the House many years ago, when I was Transport Minister, we were proposing building SH20, not tunnel, but SH20 road through Waterview. And Helen got up in the House and said that that would happen over her dead body, and my retort was that would be a small price to pay for a good road. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, tried to, um, I also tried to get some really smart aleck little uh, cuts against the, the other side. And Trevor Mallard, I'm sure, will remember this day. Labor was really polling very poorly, I think. It was about mid-94, 93. And I think poll came up with Labor on 16%. Now, we sat at our what used to be procedures and thought, how do we get a question to a minister to actually get that 16? Because as uh, Mr Peters will know, you can't ask questions unless they're actually of a ministerial responsibility. <laughs> so, I, um, I know he does, but you can't. OK. <laughs> I thought, I know what to do, and so I said to the team, right, and we put it up to procedures, and this was... So the question was to me as Minister of Broadcasting, has he had any complaints recently about the screening on TV One last week of The Sound of Music? <laughs> and I could see that when Labour and opposition were going, what the hell is this one? You know, how they work through the question. What are they getting at here? And I, they were stumped, absolutely stumped. 
And so when we got to the house, I said, so I've got it all on video if you want to see, this is cool. So I got here, question, has he uh, had any complaints about it? And I said, Mr Speaker, I actually have. I had a phone call from an irate Labour Party supporter who complained about the movie The Sound of Music, in particular the song, I am 16 going on 17. <laughs> And the supplementary was even better. Did the irate phone caller have any other songs they were upset about? I said, indeed, Mr Speaker, there were two more songs. High on the Hill, I'm a Lonely Goat Herd, and Farewell Adieu to You and You and You. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, I just want to finish up by saying it's time to move. In fact, I should have gone a while ago. I can see that. I'm a dinosaur, and I accept it. In fact, there was a really good little story Bridie sent to me out of the, the funny file. She said, you attended a primary school in your electorate many years ago, and the kids all wrote a lovely letter, as they do. You know, it was great for you to come, and I really enjoyed your speech. And one of the boys wrote, little kid, only sort of five or six, you reminded me of my favourite subject, dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow. And why I think I'm now a dinosaur is I'm, out of t I'm completely out of tune with where I think modern thinking is on both sides, on all sides. I'm out of it. I grew up in a farm house in Matamata that had scrim that moved on the walls and a pot belly stove, and in winter it was bloody freezing. And, yet, and, I, and I'm not trying to make out we were bad, poorly off. Everyone that I lived around had it, that, that was what we lived in. And yet I hear today it is my right to a warm, dry, insulated home. No, it's not. Actually, every right you have, you've got to earn it. And this idea of I should have it no matter what, in my view, is wrong. We didn't even have single glazing, some of the windows didn't close properly, so we just had nice drafts of air coming through. And similarly with regards to, um, now I know this will get Sue only really upset, but it's the same thing to do with sort of, you know, family, child support stuff for the babes when they're being born. Raven and I spent quite some time working out before we would start a family to work out how would we financially do it before she gave up working at Air New Zealand. The idea that someone would ever pay for us to do that just doesn't, it just doesn't swing for me. Now, I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to upset you because it's upsetting them as well. It's just something that <laughs> I'm from the past, I should be back in the primeval swamp, and that's where I'm going. And Mr. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, I do, I do really lament, and I was so hoping I'd have at least one target. They're not there, the journalist fraternity. Because when I came here, journalists were on about substance, they were on about why the government had done something, they would hold you to account for spending, etc. And now it's just unbelievable. 21 years ago, almost to the day in this house, David Longy gave a great speech as he was leaving, his valedictory. And he says, I can't stand it anymore, I'm getting out before the, where the journalist fraternity is going in this world gets to me. He said this, I picked up a magazine at Auckland Airport yesterday and it said, candidate fights life threatening addiction. You can check this in hand, so if you don't believe it. Candidate fights life-threatening addiction, said David. And he said, I was very intrigued with that, and when I opened it up, it said that Pam Corkery was quitting smoking. <laughs> Good heavens! I'll try and do the voice. Good heavens, said David. What next? Next week we'll be seeing How I Licked Athlete's Foot by Pam Corkery. <laughs> <laughs> and I simply agree with them. When TV3 drops Campbell live but brings on some scout program about Rachel Glucina and the gossip columnist, I feel I lost the plot here. Something's gone wrong. Vaughan Jones, the top New Zealand mathematician who's got a field medal, gets no mention, uh, because, even though he's the top man in the world. But we now know about Kim Kardashian almost nightly in her $50 million ass. <laughs> I, um, I think his name is Kanye. So that test that I've always applied is, will New Zealanders be better off? I won't go through a couple of the little stories here, but um, I have to say some of them were amazing. I had a guy in St Helias who had an alien spaceship crash through his roof, wanted me to come and help it. He donned on a, head, a helmet and had slippers on. He'd put a trampoline over the house so that the neighbours wouldn't know it. The alien was locked in the bathroom but was eating the cellulose from the wallpaper. Please help if you can, Mr Williamson. And as you'll be aware, I probably didn't do much to do that. So uh, that's it for me. I, I want to finish with a lovely quote from Edmund Burke, the British politician, who said, your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays you instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. And so, Mr Speaker, I've always held a North Star. 
I've always held a North Star, which is something to guide you by, which is for navigation. What is right, what is wrong, what matters, what doesn't, and putting that test of things. For me, it's about freedom of the individual. It's about rewarding individual effort. It's about that libertarian view of, as long as you are of age of consent and you are not causing damage to any other person, then I believe you've got a right to do it. So I voted on the Liberal side of everything. God knows back in the 80s the attacks we came under for allowing the shops to open on a weekend. Jim Knox said it was the most evil thing and it'll be the end of families and if you open the shops on a Saturday, you know who knows it won't be long before you open it on a Sunday as well. And he was dead right. He was a visionary, that Jim Knox. <laughs> but I'm a very strong free market. I'm a very strong right wing. And when it comes to the welfare state, I'm, I'm a fan of it being a hand up, but not a hand out. And I'm, I'm a fan of it being a safety net and not a trampoline. And so my North Star is probably the exact 180 degrees reverse of what Materia Ture believes in terms of what's right and wrong with the welfare state. But it is time to go. I'm off to sunny California. I've got songs in my head. I've had the cord patterning to the Eagles Hotel, California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Well, I'm leaving. I'm telling you, I am leaving. And I am looking so forward to it. It's been a great ride. There's been a lot of ups and downs. We've had a wonderful time, and I've had some wonderful people to share the journey. Thank you so much. Order. The House is suspended for the dinner break. I will resume the chair at 7.30.